please welcome Laura Smoller. Thank you, Carrie, and you all will forgive me if I sit, I hope. So magic and science in the age of Fresco Baldi. Fresco Baldi's lifetime intersects with some of the most important dates in the birth of modern science. The discoveries of Galileo, the new methods of Francis Bacon and René Descartes, the laws of astronomy of Johannes Kepler. And those same years are also witness both to a keen interest in magic and the occult and to a backlash against the new science, epitomized most famously in the burning of Giordano Bruno in Rome in 1600, and the trial and condemnation of Galileo, which unfolded in Roman and Florentine milieu known and frequented, frequent, frequented by Frescobaldi as well between the years of 1616 and 1633. Now, since at least the Enlightenment, it has become something of a commonplace to see Galileo and Bruno as martyrs of modern science. Here, in fact, is Galileo's finger, the one he allegedly wagged at the Pope, enclosed in, a 1737, enclosed in 1737 in a case that looks for all the world like a medieval reliquary. Uh, the caption online invariably says it's his third finger. Um, I'll leave you to, to draw what consequences you will. So this picture conforms to a rather comfortable narrative of the rise of science, both resisted by the backwards reactionary Catholic Church and leading to an inevitable triumph of the truth, finally of science over superstition and magic, or so the story goes. But a close look at the developments in Frescobaldi's lifetime, in places and in circles he would have known, greatly complicates that picture. As we shall see in the courts of 17th century Italy, great nobles took a keen interest in promoting knowledge about the cosmos and in exploring ways to understand and control nature, whether through new methods of observation and experimentation or through occult and magical means. Experiments, a word originally used in Latin to mean something like a magic spell, were an important component of court spectacle and entertainment. These sorts of investigations and displays took place not just in the households of great secular lords, they also featured in ecclesiastical settings, such as the Jesuit College in Rome. And as a number of scholars have demonstrated, these activities reveal not a story of the truth of science triumphing over superstition and magic, but rather a process in which magical and occult world views and practices help to feed into the development of modern experimental science. Now, to be sure, Frescobaldi, living in Rome in the years between 1608 and 1615, could hardly have failed to take some awareness of the controversies that began to swirl um, around the man who, following the 1610 publication of his starry messenger announcing the discovery through his telescope of the moons of Jupiter, had been named the official philosopher of the Medici Grand Duke of Tuscany after whom he named his new discoveries and to whom he dedicated the treatise. In the spring of 1611, Galileo first observed sunspots through his telescope and staged a series of demonstrations in Rome, after which he was honored by a banquet at the Jesuit College. Aware that his discoveries contradicted both the accepted Aristotelian natural philosophy and key passages in the Bible, Galileo set about to defend Copernicanism, that is the theory that the Earth and other planets in fact revolved around the sun rather than the Earth standing at the center of the universe. And he tried to reconcile Copernicus's theories with scripture. The result was the Inquisition's 1616 command to Galileo to cease defending Copernicus 
and the subsequent condemnation of Copernicus's book. Still, by the early 1620s, Galileo placed a great deal of hope in the goodwill of the newly elected Barberini Pope Urban VIII, whose family also served as patrons for Frescobaldi in the years between 1634 and 43. In 1624, Galileo traveled to Rome to meet with the pontiff. The result of several meetings was Urban's concession that Galileo could discuss Copernicanism, but only as a hypothesis. Perhaps Urban hoped either to gain some dedication, like the Tuscan Grand Duke's Medicean stars, or even more directly to benefit from Galileo's experience as astronomer and astrologer. The Pope was passionately devoted to astrology, and after a 1628 prediction foresaw an imminent threat, he in fact called in the astrologer Tommaso Campanella for some sort of a ritual to counteract the stars pestiferous influences in a secret chamber in the Castel Gandolfo. A second astrological prediction of the Pope's own imminent death in the year 1630 led Urban to hunt down, try, and convict the astrologer in question, one Orazio Morandi, the abbot of the monastery of Santa Presida and an intimate of Galileo's and to issue what one scholar has labeled some of the severest anti-astrology legislation ever written. Certainly, after Galileo in 1632 published his pointed dialogue on the two chief world systems, Urban's support was gone. The Pope is said to have flown into a rage at the book, and he certainly afterwards allowed Galileo's enemies free reign in pursuing Galileo's conviction for vehement suspicion of heresy in 1633. Still, it has been increasingly hard for modern historians to read Galileo's trial simply as a case of a martyr of modern science. Recent analysis, most notably the work of Thomas Meyer, points out the sheer contingency of the result of the trial, which, as Meyer writes, could have had another outcome in which Galileo would not have been forced to renounce some of his most important beliefs. Viewed through the lens of prosopography, that is, the study of the personalities, family connections, and personal enmities of those involved in the proceedings, Galileo's trial reveals the intricate mechanisms and machinations of the powerful and not so powerful who formed part of a tangled web of religion, politics, diplomacy, bureaucracy, culture, and science. Galileo himself appears more as a failed courtier who did not correctly play the game of flattery, and his trial, a series of vendettas that sometimes had very little to do with Galileo or his discoveries or the ideas of Copernicus. That Galileo's initial discoveries landed him in a position as philosopher to the Grand Duke of Tuscany shows us the importance of court culture and patronage for the study of both magic and science in Frescobaldi's time. In part, this interest grew out of a centuries-old passion on the part of European elites for collecting marvels a hobby that had evolved in the 16th century into the personal museum or Wunderkammer, such as the famous specimen collection of Ulissi Aldrovandi in Bologna, whose written catalog ran to 187 folio volumes, plus there were also some 200 additional bags of loose paper cataloging the museum. The Papal Palace also possessed an outstanding collection of mineral specimens. Now, if 16th century Italian elites had collected natural specimens and curiosities like these, and, there's, and if you want to play Where's Waldo, there's inevitably both a crocodile and the harder one to find an armadillo in any one of these cabinets. So if 16th century Italian elites had collected natural specimens and curiosities in elaborate museums and wunderkammers, by the 17th century, these museums had become laboratories as well. Knowledge, insisted 17th century collectors, was to be authenticated by experiment first and authority second. 
Experimental demonstrations were performed with the goal of testing problems and debated points from ancient authors. For example, whereas Aristotle had said that bear cubs were born as unformed lumps of flesh and then the mother bear licked them into shape, literally, um, the museum of, in, in the Senate of Bologna, according to one 17th century witness, ha had a jar in which a bear cub is preserved and closed in a jar which has been extracted from the womb but no part of it appears imperfect. In other words, even in the womb, it still looked like a baby bear. Um, or, in other words, broader, more broadly, experience showed authority, Aristotle's, to be wrong. Dissections and demonstrations were also popular entertainments in museums and courts in 17th century Italy. In Tuscany, for example, the Medici Grand Dukes, that is, Galileo's patrons and Frescobaldi's patrons, frequently staged such events for their guests. At one memorable dinner, for example, 250 vipers were decapitated before the eager guests in an effort to determine the origin of the snake's venom. Medici visitors were also treated to the dissections of a poisoned dog, a bear, and a brain. Great dinner party. Frequently, such demonstrations took delight in overturning the assumptions of natural philosophy, as did the jarred Bologna bear cub, cub also. Again, at the Medici court, for one demonstration, samples of dung, some covered and some open to the air, were, were scattered around the palace in order to see if insects were indeed spontaneously generated out of manure. Um, the, um, the guests at the dinner party uh, were able to observe flies and gnats swarming only around those piles of dung that were open to the air, um, and thereby the theory of spontaneous generation was disproven. So the world of the court, the world in which our Frescobaldi also moved, was thus the site of important conversations and demonstrations in which experiments and experience began to trump received scientific authority. The same impulse to trust experience and experiment over received authority can be seen in the intensive interest in magic and the occult during Frescobaldi's lifetime. Illustrative in this respect is one of the most famous and popular intellectual figures of the late 16th and century and beyond, uh, the Neapolitan polymath Giambattista della Porta, author of more than a dozen works, including most notably for us a four treatise book on natural magic, which was first published in 1558 and which went through 16 Latin and more than a dozen vernacular editions in the next three decades before della Porta published a revised and expanded version in 1589. Della Porta described himself as a professor of secrets, or a scrutinizer of the secrets of nature. Secrets that he uncovered and published for his readers, not, again, through reading accepted authorities, but through a program of experiments designed to discover the hidden or occult qualities locked in the forms of natural objects that couldn't be deduced, but only could be known empirically through experience. Through these occult qualities, as well as through an understanding of the hidden sympathies and antipathies that connected all objects in the universe, an operator in the know, like Della Porta, would be able to manipulate nature, or, in Della Porta's words, to work natural magic. Some of Della Porta's natural magic admittedly sounds like what we might label today technique or technology. For example, he instructed his readers that if they wish to make their roses bloom later in the season, they should pinch off the early buds and let the later ones flower. Okay, great, magic. <laughs> Other instructions depended upon the occult properties of natural things that were revealed through, through clues or what Della Porta called signatures set throughout nature, such as here a scorpion-shaped plant, which was good for relieving, surprise, surprise, scorpions stings, or the plant on the left where a hand-shaped palm indicates that it would be, a uh, hand-shaped root indicates that it would be good for hand troubles. Uh, similarly, Della Porta said that since we, and you've got to trust him here, since we tame bulls by tying them to fig trees, 
um, then we can use fig stalks to tenderize beef. He, he also instructed his readers that a hyena's shadow will silence barking dogs, that a magic lamp fueled with hare's fat will make even respectable women strip naked, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Now, while it may sound as if Delaporta's natural magic has nothing that could possibly be related to the development of modern experimental science, scholars of the last several decades have argued otherwise. Um, for example, for historian Pamela H. Smith, from the scientific underworld occupied by professors of secrets emerged a naturalized concept of human beings and innovative ideas about science. And it should be mentioned that Della Porta's contacts included Tommaso Campanella, uh, that is Pope Urban VIII's astrologer, and Federico Cesi, who was a protector of Galileo and also founder of the Roman Accademia dei Lincei, that is the Academy of the Lynx-Eyed Ones, an academy of experimental research of which Galileo was also a member. As William Eben has noted, Della Porta and other professors of secrets frequently insisted that reason and authority were useless in finding out the secrets of nature, and they preferred instead the metaphor of the hunter who looks for tracks and clues in, in pursuing his prey and who has to rely on his cunning and intuition. And that's also the metaphor involved in this idea of the lynx-eyed ones, too. This same metaphor of the hunt would be employed by new scientists of the 17th century, people like Pierre Gassendi and Francis Bacon. And it underlies an idea of science as a search for new facts, from which one worked backwards or upwards towards an understanding of causes. Like Della Porta, who described his natural magic as the science of the extraordinary rather than the ordinary, Francis Bacon, would make much of marvels and wonders as a means to understanding nature. From the wonders of nature, he would write, again employing the metaphor of the hunt, is the nearest intelligence and passage towards the wonders of art or technology. For it is no more by following and as it were hounding nature in her wanderings to be able to lead her afterwards to the same place again. Francis Bacon's ultimate goal, as he described it, was not the creation of a new method of acquiring knowledge, that for which he is best known, um, but the application of the scientist's knowledge of causes to, as Bacon said, the relief of man's estate, or the production of effects, which Bacon, just like Della Porta, called natural magic. In short, far from finding science triumphing over superstitious magic in the age of Frescobaldi, rather in the natural magic of a Bacon or a Della Porta, we find both the methods of the new experimental science and the model for this type of knowledge and what it could do for those who possessed it. I've mentioned already the Jesuit College at Rome as a place where Galileo demonstrated the existence of sunspots with his telescope, and in which he was, for a while at least, welcomed and fed. The Jesuit College, as well as the number of high churchmen who served as patrons or defenders of Galileo, serves to show us that our contemporary myth of modern science standing up against an oppressive Catholic hierarchy is no more than that, a convenient myth that tells us much more about enlightenment self-constructions self to which we are all heirs than it does about science and religion in the 17th century. The Jesuit College in Rome, in fact, became the site of one of the most remarkable and original amalgamations of science, magic, and religion in the 17th century in the pursuits of a scholar named Athanasius Kircher. Kircher, a refugee from a German empire ravaged by the Thirty Years' War, arrived in Rome just after Galileo's condemnation in 1633, and thus his time in Rome overlapped with Frescobaldi's in the years 1634 to 43. Upon his arrival, Kircher already had a reputation as a sort of wunderkind, with his knowledge of 12 languages and his command of seemingly every subject imaginable. He had an ambitious goal also to reform the world by collecting and synthesizing all of human knowledge, 
a goal that was to be initiated by his amassing of a collection of thousands of objects, both natural and man-made, in a museum in the Jesuit College in Rome. And the key to that synthesis of human knowledge was going to arise out of Kircher's virtual obsession with hieroglyphics. He was struck, as many visitors are, by the number of Egyptian obelisks in the city of Rome, war trophies from the Roman Empire's glory days. And he also was puzzled by the mysterious symbols inscribed upon them. He devoted years to trying to decipher their meaning, always feeling he was just on the verge of the real breakthrough. Although his passion for hieroglyphics certainly fit with his, the polyglot's larger interest in languages in general, hieroglyphics for Kircher also held special meaning. He viewed nature itself as a forest of mysteries, secrets, and sympathetic virtues, clues to which could be found in hidden signs or hieroglyphics embedded in nature. His view thus was not dissimilar to Giambattista della Porta's doctrine of signatures that pointed to those occult powers in natural objects. For Kircher, the magnet, whose powers were observed but mysteriously unexplained, was emblematic of this view of nature. And a magnet actually formed the center of his museum in the Jesuit college. And for Kircher, was the key to the entire universe. Now, if hieroglyphics were crucial to Kircher's understanding of nature, they also formed a center of his theories about human knowledge. Because remember, Kircher's true goal was reform. And he thought that could happen by restoring to human beings the perfect knowledge that Adam had possessed before the fall, a project that was admittedly made more difficult by the fact that we had lost Adam's original language at the moment of the construction of the Tower of Babel. The tower itself symbolized to Kircher the problems of his own time, confusion, disagreement and human pride. It represented the misuse of knowledge par excellence. And while we could not recover Adam's language, Kircher hoped that some new universal language might lead to harmony among humans. He would have been quite dismayed to know that the Esperanto coffee house in Greenwich Village is no longer. Like other operators of 17th century museums, Kircher celebrated the ability of experiment to create and authenticate knowledge. One of his devoted students published a volume of 300 experiments undertaken by Kircher at the Jesuit College in Rome. Thus, he partook of the methods of the new experimental science, although his experiments at times were designed to prove tenets of the old Aristotelian natural philosophy, such as the thesis that nature abhors a vacuum or that perpetual motion was impossible. And like many in the 17th century, Kircher hoped that a reformed knowledge of nature acquired using a new method would bring to humans the ability to control nature, a control for which he, like Della Porta and like Francis Bacon, used the word magic. Kircher, in fact, distinguished two sorts of licit magic. There was also illicit magic, which involved consorting with demons, but he didn't want to have any part of that. But on, under licit magic, he distinguished uh, natural magic, which depended on occult forces of nature, and then a second category he called mathematical or artificial magic, in which one produced marvelous effects through optical, hydraulic, or mechanical techniques, resulting in objects that rivaled or outdid nature, such as mechanical birds that perched in a garden and thanks to a secret hydraulic art sang to people as they strolled by, or a machine that traveled underwater, or automata that mimicked human movements, or a vomiting cooked lobster that siphoned water from one container to another, or a sunflower clock. Um, and the little Latin inscription says the marriage of art and nature. Um, or even the magnificent fountain of the four rivers that Kircher helped with the design of for the Piazza Navona in Rome in 1650. 
that this brand of mathematical magic looks to us like fanciful technology is beside the point. For Kircher and others, the loaded term magic was the one they chose to describe this bravado control over nature. So with the Jesuit Kircher arriving in Rome on the heels of Galileo's condemnation and carrying out a program of experimentation that led to a magical control of nature, we see fully, I hope, the points with which I began this talk. First, contrary to our modern myth, the story of the scientific revolution cannot be made into a narrative of scientific truth challenging the beliefs of a monolithic Catholic orthodoxy. There were plenty of highly placed clerics who supported an in-depth inquiry into nature and all of its secrets, hounding her out of her accustomed hiding places by experiments and demonstrations that by their very design celebrated the value of experience over authority. Second, the mastery sought by proponents of the new scientific methods borrowed its goals and its methods from a body of knowledge explicitly labeled natural magic a moniker that new scientists like Bacon and Kircher alike heartily embraced for the control of nature. And third, these conversations, demonstrations, and activities about magic science and nature were taking place in the very social circles that offered patronage to someone like Frescobaldi, the secular and ecclesiastical courts of the 17th century elite. I'd like to close with one final emblem of this blend of religion, magic, science, and technology that marks the early 17th century. An image taken from a book by one of Athanasius Kircher's disciples and prized colleagues, the German Jesuit Gaspar Schott. The title of Schott's book, published in 1657, is Universal Magic of Nature and Art. And what he depicts here is an instrument also described by Kircher the cat piano, an instrument whose keys, when struck, drove nails into a set of specially chosen and enclosed cats, which Kircher promised would cure the most melancholic ruler of his lethargy. <laughs> to such fanciful magical imaginations on the part of 17th century Jesuits, we owe in part our modern scientific worldview. And I'd like to think that Frescobaldi knew of the cat clavier, and that somewhere is waiting to be discovered a manuscript with a composition for it by him, a toccata, or rather, a toccata. <laughs>